Good afternoon, boa tarde, bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Welcome to this pressing discussion on Brazil's future in the presidential ballot box. My name is João Bill. I teach anthropology here at Princeton University, and I'm the director of the Brazil Lab at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this event. We are grateful to the program in Latin American Studies, the Department of Anthropology, and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese for their co-sponsorship. With the elections scheduled for this coming October, the incumbent Jair Bolsonaro and the former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, are in a heated campaign for the hearts and minds and digital identities of an increasingly polarized Brazilian society. Many say this race will decide the fate of the world's fourth largest democracy and its capacity to sustain hard-fought constitutional rights and to safeguard its biggest treasure, the Amazonian rainforest, a vital planetary nexus. As we all know, in the past few years, Bolsonaro has made headlines around the world for his authoritarianism and racism, destructive environmental policies, and denialist stance on the COVID-19 pandemic, and the list goes on. In the meantime, Lula has been cleared of criminal charges and has again shifted the political gravitational field through new and old alliances, and the promise of putting the country back on track on the fight against inequality and for a future of prosperity that always seems to fall from view. A third option seems to be out of question. A third way option seems to be out of question. And recent polls show Bolsonaro trading Lula, but remaining strong in his quest to reach the decisive runoff in November. We have two of Brazil's most brilliant and lucid political thinkers with us today, Patricia de Campos Melo and Miguel Lago. They will help us tease out some of the many facets of this political face-off. And even though they don't have crystal balls, we want to hear from Patricia and Miguel where they see the political future bending towards and to which possible effects. Patricia Campos Melo is an award-winning investigative journalist and columnist at Folha de São Paulo, Brazil's premier daily newspaper. She's widely known for her fierce reporting on fake news and the illegal use of mass messaging to influence public opinion. Patricia is the author of the book, A Máquina do Ódio, The Hate Machine, that explores the disinformation campaigns mobilized by populist leaders in Brazil, India, and the United States. She's currently a research fellow at Columbia University. Thank you for being with us, Patricia. It's such an honor and such a pleasure. So Miguel Lago is a political scientist and a visiting professor at Columbia University and at Science Po. He's the co-founder of the nonprofit NOSAS, a cutting edge laboratory for social mobilization and civic engagement. Miguel directs the Institute for Health Policy Studies, IEPS, a think and do tank and a partner of the Brazil Lab that advocates for the improvement of public health policies. A political essayist, he is also a frequent contributor to the, maga to the magazine POE. And we just learned that his, his book that he co-authored with Eloise Starling and Nilton Bunhoto, Uma Linguagem da Destruição, or A Linguagem da Destruição, The Language of the Structure has just come out and he can share a little bit with us later in the conversation as well. So thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Patricia. And this is our format today. Patricia and Miguel will speak for about 15 minutes each and will then engage in a brief back and forth. For the audience watching from home, the chat on our YouTube channel is open. So please feel free to ask questions as the event unfolds. Our team will be collecting your questions and will forward them to me. I will then pass them on to our speakers. The event will end at 5.45 p.m. sharp. So thank you all for being with us today. Patricia, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, João, for such a generous introduction. And it's a huge honor to be here participating and with the colleagues like uh, Miguel. And thank you so much. Um, well, I do not have a crystal ball, as you <laughs> said. Uh, but I think what we can uh, speculate a little bit is what scenario we're seeing at this point in Brazil. But for that, I would like to start by remembering a bit what the country went through in 2018. 
Um, it's interesting how we have so many books discussing um, how democracy dies uh, in a different way. I mean, if you look, if you go to a library, there's or to a bookstore, there's so many books about, you know, the erosion of democracy and you don't need to have a classic coup d'etat, etc. But the other thing that's not uh, as much, not discussed as much, is this new kind of censorship. This, the same way uh, we have this new sort of authoritarianism, the stealth authoritarianism, as um, Zivorsky says, and I'm mispronouncing his name, I'm sorry. Uh, we have the censorship by noise, which is really a very um, important weapon of these digital uh, populists, such as uh, Bolsonaro and former President Trump, and uh, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, and so many others, and uh, Narendra Modi in India, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, for these populist leaders to um, communicate directly, or or trying to avoid filters with their supporters, uh, they need to do two things. On the one hand, they're going to be flooding social media and uh, friendly traditional media with the narratives they want to prevail. On the other hand, they're going to be attacking and engaging in character assassination against uh, opposition leaders, journalists, uh, uh, scientists, academics, uh, in general, anyone who has an independent voice. And this is what we have been seeing in the last four years uh, during the Bolsonaro administration. Um, people always ask, well, wasn't it really, I mean, is that the first time that the uh, journalism or media is attacked in Brazil? No, it's not the first time. We know that it's a very, it's very, uh, it's sort of a tradition that you, you're going to have this hostility between governments and journalists. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Journalists are annoying, we're investigating, we're, you know, questioning. Um, but we've never seen anything like that, like we have been uh, living in the four years in terms of uh, this uh, blatant attempt to silence divergent voices and not uh, through the classic censorship. I mean, that is also used, but with this censorship by noise. Uh, in 2018 uh, Brazilian election, it, it became uh, emblematic of the way uh, social media can be used to manipulate or to try to manipulate public opinion. We had uh, seen the experience of 2016 election in the US, which was sort of an epiphany for everyone. I mean, it's it was not new, but the way it was very uh, open and widespread, the way uh, Facebook and you know uh, Twitter uh, were used also to try to manipulate uh, the narrative in the US. We saw this in Brazil in 2018, but the difference is, Brazil is a WhatsApp country, so we saw uh, widespread use of WhatsApp groups to spread disinformation uh, campaigns. And also Facebook, I mean, and it caught all of us, including electoral authorities and journalists and scientists, we were really not expecting that. Um, at that time, I, I remember when I started reporting about this, the general view was that, no, you know, uh, it's just we, we have this joke in Portuguese that is the uh, WhatsApp ant. It's your ant who likes to be, you know, uh, forwarding messages on WhatsApp is harmless. There's no automation. And then it became clear that, yes, there is a lot of automation. Of course, always when you have uh, a propaganda network, uh, the beauty of it and actually the the reason it's scary, it's always a combination of automation, which can be, you know, bots or uh, auto automated uh, messages, mass messaging or cyborgs and real people. I mean, in conjunction, you, you, you need real people who are believing your message uh, to help amplify it. And that's been the case in Brazil uh, since 2018. Uh, the disinformation techniques that were used during the electoral campaign were basically uh, transported uh, to inside the presidential palace with the so-called uh, hate cabinet, which is a team of advisors that are, you know, uh, paid with taxpayers' uh, money. Uh, they work for the president and they um, have this digital strategy in mind, which includes character assassination, spreading uh, disinformation, smokescreen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
after 2018, I think there's been uh, the good the good uh, good news is that there's been a lot of changes in terms of authorities. Uh, electoral authorities are much more aware of what was happening. So, for instance, the the um, Superior Electoral Court. Uh, implemented a resolution, which is sort of, it's not a legislation, it's regulation that bans mass messaging that was being done uh, so, uh, you know, it was so widespread in 2018. And even WhatsApp, the platform, uh, realized that it was awful PR for them. You know, they were not acting against it. So they started uh, suing uh marketing agencies that were offering these kinds of services. They started cooperating with, with authorities. And, and last of all, uh, the Supreme Court, Brazilian Supreme Court last year um, had a ruling that basically set a precedent that um, if uh, social media is used, be it you know with uh, this information in, um, there were two actually two rulings that were very important and that set precedents. Uh, one was that uh, you would consider um, mass messaging as a uh, mass communication uh, uh, outlet, sort of. Uh, if you misuse it, your uh, candidacy might be annulled. So this is the set of precedent. And on the other hand, uh, there was a, a candidacy that was uh, annulled for someone uh, he was running for um, he was a, a local legislator uh, because he spread, he had on this live uh, Facebook uh, video saying that the elections had been uh, fraudulent in 2018. Uh, so these two things are being used sort of as uh, try to vaccines uh, against disinformation uh, uh, campaigns in 2022. So this is the good news. Uh, what's the bad news? The bad news is that uh, President Bolsonaro is uh, emulating uh, the whole fraudulent election narrative that we saw in the US in 2020. I mean, it's it's so similar, it's, it's almost ridiculous. Um, here in the US, the whole, I mean, uh, former President Trump started, uh, let's say, uh, sowing doubts about uh, mail-in voting. Uh, in the beginning of 2020, uh, and then he disputed the results uh, once uh, they were sort of consolidated among all the states. And then, I mean, the whole, the uh, humongous wave of disinformation ended up, uh, you know, in the invasion of the Capitol on uh, January 6, that uh, left five people dead. And uh, also very, very uh, concerning, over 50%, according to some polling, is over 60% of Republican voters do not believe that President Biden is a legitimate president and they think the elections were stolen. So in Brazil, uh, the narrative is uh, voting machines are not trustworthy. There's been a lot of frauds, uh, so we cannot trust the results. The president tried to um, enact, or I mean, his allies tried to approve a, a constitutional amendment last year, changing the way voting is the, the system, uh, the voting system in Brazil to get paper ballots. <clears throat> they did not uh, manage to do that. Uh, so he is insisting on this narrative of, you know, you cannot trust results because uh, hackers have already uh, rigged machines, blah, blah, blah. And so sort of preemptively disputing results uh, in case results are not something that are positive for him in October. Uh, so this is very concerning because it's, uh, it's not only the classic disinformation of attacking your opponents or spreading or actually, you know, investing in the, the cultural wars and, and the values voter, you know, about uh, hot button issues, abortion, uh, um, drugs. Uh, it's also undermining the trust in the electoral system, in democracy. And, and this is being done, has been done for the last, I don't know, two years uh, by President uh, Jair Bolsonaro. The institutions, uh, journalists, uh, scientists, uh, electoral authorities, everybody is more uh, aware of these attempts to manipulate elections with uh, social media and, and people's uh, and voters' personal data. Uh, 
However, uh, it's still, um, in, in Brazil, we have a few, I mean, several problems, but in that sense, one of them is uh, that internet platforms are much more concerned about moderation and, and are they invest a lot more in moderation policies and in, mod, and in people, right, and in AI for moderation in English speaking countries. So even though internet platforms, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they are saying they are concerned, they're paying attention, they're gonna be moderating and they're gonna to try to uh, eliminate uh, speech that glorifies violence or is against civic in integrity. We don't really know how much attention they're paying to this and how much they have in terms of having enough people and AI to moderate this type of content. So. And on top of all, um, compared to the US uh, in 2020, these internet platforms did enact several policy product changes and moderation policies and, and transparency commitments uh, for the elections. Uh, turns out they were not enough, right? But still, they did have several commitments. In Brazil, uh, they are not as concerned. So basically, we're entering the electoral campaign without knowing what internet platforms are going to do if we have political actors using social media to incite violence, to dispute electoral results, and basically to incite people. They could, I mean, any one actor could use a Facebook live video or a YouTube to say, you know, there's been fraud in such a polling station, so you should go there and confront the, the workers who are there because the results are rigged. We don't know what the platforms are going to do. There's no transparency in terms of moderation policies. So in that sense, I am very concerned, even though there is a lot more awareness, I don't think we would say we would see the same kind of thing uh, we saw in 2018. Uh, there are new threats in terms of this narrative and the way it's an attack not only on the opponents, but uh, an attack against the electoral system itself. And lastly, because I think I already spoke too much, uh, um, there's been an announcement today, just because you know we journalists, we like uh, breaking news. So I'm just gonna use this, this breaking news angle that uh, WhatsApp is implementing worldwide this new product called Communities, which is basically a big group that is an umbrella for several groups that in the end, you're gonna have thousands of people in WhatsApp groups end-to-end -end encrypted. This is like a weapon of mass destruction for disinformation, because basically what we had in 2018, uh, we could have this with, instead of 256 uh, users in each group, thousands of users in several groups all together, and with administrators who could be using this as uh, a broadcast, like uh, to, to send messages to all these thousands of people. This is basically what's being done uh, with Telegram. Uh, we had this migration of uh, mainly extreme right groups and I mean, also the politicians and, and President Bolsonaro, you know, telling people, you know, let's go, you should follow me on Telegram. So we might end up having this on WhatsApp as well. And WhatsApp is installed in over 98% of smartphones in Brazil. So WhatsApp equals internet equals cell phones. So in that sense, the WhatsApp has made a commitment to the electoral authorities that they're not gonna start the service in Brazil before uh, the end of the elections in 2022. However, they did not guarantee, they would not start this before inauguration. And as we saw in the US, this period, right after you know, voting results and before inauguration, can be a very sensitive period. Uh, so there's a big concern about this. I'm sorry not to end it on a more optimistic note, but I just, I mean, on the one hand, I, I know people are watching and we are more aware and authorities are more aware. On the other hand, I think the challenges are bigger uh, this time. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia, for, for this. Um you know, powerful and sober and concerning a review. And I think uh, it's, it's apropos now that we hear from the author of The Language of Destruction, Miguel Lago. Thank you so much, Ro. Uh, thank you so much, Ro, Miguel, and so much for the invitation. I'm extremely honored to be here discussing with Patricia. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, well, uh, so, uh, 
let's see if I, I I'm, I'm, I'll try to answer your question, like what will happen this, this election? And I see two possible scenarios. Um, first scenario, um, I think that, um, well, the first scenario will be Bolsonaro gets reelected by popular vote, which is absolutely possible. Uh, this scenario will mean, first of all, a major, major uh, case for political science uh, and to, for political scientists to review absolutely all the literature that, that you have, because it will be probably the first time where uh, a government performance is completely divorced of popularity. Because um, I know that we compare Bolsonaro a lot with Trump, a lot with uh, Orban, uh, uh, with Modi, uh, with Putin, uh, whoever. Um, but all those guys, they are extreme right, far right, uh, autocrats, everything that you want to. But they, they do have uh, technocrats in their governments. And as any government in the history of the world uh, has uh, done some good public policies. So uh, it's understandable that uh, Modi gets reelected. It's understandable that Orban could get reelected, uh, but it's not the case for Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro did the most awful government that anyone could do. He has no technocrats in his government, none at all. Uh, nobody wants to. Nobody who's uh, serious could work in his government. So uh, it will be a, a first case, and Brazil will certainly enter for the history of political science. Uh, that uh, how how such a um, uh, an incompetent government can get reelected. So this is the first scenario. The first scenario is uh, of course an atrocity in terms of democratic uh, terms for Brazil, because this will mean uh, a re-election of Bolsonaro, someone who is explicitly uh, uh, authoritarian, uh, would 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 mean basically that uh, our young democracy. Uh, would not thrive uh, after after um, uh, eight years of Bolsonaro. So, uh, so this this election is absolutely essential. And defeating Bolsonaro, it's the only way uh, uh, for for us to. I would not even say to, to have uh, to have a democratic society because I think we're far from that. Uh, but to keep some democratic governance and some democratic institutions, uh, if he gets reelected, I don't think will have any. Uh, so, so, so this is the, but, and this scenario is scary, but it's realistic. Second scenario, uh, Bolsonaro is defeated um, on the election by Lula or someone else. Uh, uh, I, I, and I see that this, uh, this scenario, uh, I see exactly <laughs> all the things that Patricia said, <laughs> which are really scary. <laughs> so uh, we'll see, uh, Probably 20, at least 20, 25 percent of the population uh, saying it's a fraud. Uh, we'll have um, a lot of violence. Uh, we'll have the president himself uh, not agreeing on passing uh, his mandate to the, the next president uh, who just got elected. Uh, we'll have some two crazy months. Uh, we're not sure how uh, the, let's say, the repressive forces of Brazil will react. Uh, so the army uh, who's basically composing uh, um, a large part of this administration and uh, uh, the police forces who are very ideologically aligned uh, with uh, the president. Uh, so, so both scenarios are quite catastrophic um, because of course the second scenario means that we might uh, keep a democracy, at least uh, the population said that, like, we want to keep democracy, we don't want Bolsonaro any, any longer, uh, but still um, a governing in this uh, context and, and even, I don't know, uh, taking charge and, and having an inauguration uh, in, this, in this context will be extremely hard. And yet, the press, the political parties, the civil society is treating this election as any other election. We don't, we don't have any possible positive outcome of this election. And yet we're saying, no, so the alliances that Lula is doing with Alckmin, and then you have like a, a lot of political parties who are trying to put some candidate who's like, <laughs> will have 1% of votes 
and um, and Bolsonaro now is a, so it's like we're we're constantly uh, talking of, the, of this election as as if it was an election between right and left and uh, and a regular election, and I see that this is uh, the biggest uh, problem. Uh, we should see this election not uh, a, a, as an election, but 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 as but as the the uh, the last possibility of keeping some democratic governance in Brazil. And we should treat uh, the seriousness of this, uh, uh, of, of, of this matter and, and, and of this event. Um, and uh, what I'm very worried is that when I see the discourse uh, inside within the democratic, let's say, uh, forces from the right wing to the left wing, uh, I see a lot of optimism from the from the let's say the, the left Democrats with the with Lula's candidacy and and Lula of course uh, is um, a, a very important leader uh, one of the most important leaders uh, that we we have created in our history uh, and uh, and even a few weeks ago we had people like imagine that he could win in the first round. And, and, and imagining the scenario, uh, so extremely optimistic. And they are discussing like uh, who will be minister, who will be in charge of what, etc. Uh, and then in the in the right wing, uh, uh, where, where uh, in the democratic right wing uh, and the center, where you have the discussions around the Tercera Via, which will be the third uh, way, or let's say the the, the democratic right uh, candidate, and. Uh, and and they believe that they will have a candidate that could beat Bolsonaro in the first round, uh, and and they are criticizing Lula all the time, and Lula is criticizing all the time <laughs> the democratic right. So it's it's quite funny because none of the players are taking Bolsonaro uh, as a serious candidate and uh, the biggest threat that which which he is. So uh, so so this really worries me a lot because I think that we're repeating. Of course, we, history doesn't repeat itself. But I think we're repeating a little bit 2018, where um, the political uh, families and political groups are so obsessed uh, with their uh, with their agenda, with their uh, own interests and their organizational interests, that again, someone who's extremely smart, uh, who's who's uh, even though he's very incompetent governing, he's extremely smart uh, electorally and politically. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro is benefiting of this so um so i'm 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 very worried with <laughs> with this election and um just uh, of course we have now uh, uh again uh, the, the government of, of bolsonaro uh, uh, it should he shouldn't be reelected based on on his governance and on his government performance but this is not impossible because bolsonaro uh, speaks another language a language that is completely integrated with the, the logics of the multicast, while Lula, who's a who's a very interesting and very charismatic leader as well, um, but he he speaks the language of the broadcast. Uh, Lula, last time he was he was in an election was 2006, 16 years ago, and um, and, and a lot has changed on, on political communication since then. Um, uh, Lula um, is contradicting himself constantly now in the last weeks, something that is absolutely unbearable uh, to, to have contradictions in the, in the multicast environment um, because you don't have time for that. And Bolsonaro knows really well how to use those contradictions. So basically Lula said uh, last week that he was in favor of the legalization of the abortion. And then he said, no, but he's against abortion. So his, his, of course he had a, a good argument about this. Okay, you can be against abortion and pro the legalization of abortion. Okay, but still uh, for, for the other side was, there was a, 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 there was a sign of, of a lot of contradiction. So, um, so I, I, I fear for all those reasons that we might be uh, getting to a re-election of Bolsonaro because we're treating this election as if it was any other election. So this is my my main message here, and, and I, will, I, I would love to keep the conversation going on. 
Wow, thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, Patricia, do you, do, you, do you have any like follow-up comments after hearing Miguel? And then maybe Miguel can kind of come I, back and ask you a question or comment on some of uh, the incredibly powerful and concerning um, info you shared with us. Yes, Joan, I definitely have some comments. Um, I think um, Miguel is exactly right when he says, we are viewing uh, this election as if it were a normal election. Uh, and from what we saw, okay, if Bolsonaro gets reelected, he gets to pick another two justices in Supreme Court. He gets to pick another gazillion judges in all other uh, courts, right? So up until now, checks and balances, um, the only uh, power that was still standing was the judiciary uh, branch, because the legislative branch has been uh, co-opted, uh, has been bought, basically, with the whole uh, emendas, the uh, relator, which is some pork barrel spending that's been buying votes. Uh, and well, the executive branch, he, he controls the executive branch. So if we think about um, other populist leaders, again, they are different. And I do agree that when we're comparing Bolsonaro with Modi, with, I mean, these guys or Trump, at least they had a good economy. They had a good economic policy, you know, like people were not uh, just seeing their income levels uh, shrink, sink, actually. So it, it's even more puzzling how he can be really uh, competitive in these elections. But I mean, if we think about other populist leaders that managed to get uh, reelected, uh, let's think about Orban. Orban got reelected and he finished uh, dismantling checks and balances in Hungary, including independent media, judiciary, everything, right? And even like gerrymandering. Uh, so this year, everybody was really uh, hopeful that the alliance the opposition had, which uh, gathered people from you know, the progressives up until the extreme right wing, uh, the Jobbik, would defeat uh, Orban. Not only did not defeat Orban, but Orban had a very uh, comfortable lead. Uh, it was a very, uh, it was a big victory, right? So it shows the dangers of re-election. I mean, because uh, you can uh, maneuver inside democracy to make uh, almost impossible for the opposition to win elections, right? Be it gerrymandering, be, you know, just, uh, uh, We've seen this. We've seen this in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Hungary, in Turkey. So in that sense, I totally agree uh, with Miguel that uh, people are viewing these elections as if they were just you know, regular elections. But what we are risking is uh, the end of you know, what's, what remains of checks and balances in Brazil. Miguel, you want to jump back in? No, absolutely, I, I, I agree that uh, this uh, the Supreme Court is the last. Um, uh, let's say it's 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 what's uh, maintaining some checks and balances. I also think that it's interesting, also from the Supreme Court, from a uh, from from the perspective of of, of uh, misinformation and uh, of um, let's say online communication. It's interesting because the judiciary in Brazil is taking uh, the words as they are being said. So. If someone says I want to kill uh, the judge, so they're they're taking it seriously. Uh, so so let's say that words have um, uh, have juridical uh, meaning uh, in Brazil, and I think this is great because um, we had we had that. This was so strong. I remember in 2018 when I was trying to persuade some people not voting on Bolsonaro, and they were saying like the rational voters of Bolsonaro, and they were who are the worst, <laughs> and they, and they were saying um, no, but it's. It's just words. When, once he gets there, like and, and no, it's not just words. Words um, are, are really powerful, and and and, uh, and 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 politics is it's about discourse. Uh, it's not only about public policies. And and uh, as we can see, uh, the the way that uh, Bolsonaro's discourse shaped and influenced and impacted uh, our the population behavior under COVID nineteen, and and helped spreading the virus. So. Uh, words can kill. Uh, words can uh, can have a big impact. So I think it's it's um, the Supreme Court is doing a a very interesting 
uh, work uh, uh, that is very challenging because we, we still don't know how to deal with this new infosphere and and this this new um, uh, uh, this new kind of, of political discourse um, that that is a great discourse uh, and, and 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 that happens in the in the social networks and uh, that should not uh, theoretically have have any consequences in terms of action, but I think it's um, uh, and I agree uh, with Patricia. I mean, he can he can change a lot of things, um, uh, and especially the Supreme Court. So, so yes, um, uh, and that's why again I insist that this election it's absolutely um, uh, crucial, uh, and it's a referendum almost on democracy. It's a referendum on on the on our constitutional uh, 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 bill, and and yeah. So that's that's what I think. Well, so I uh, I've been listening intently in our in our audience as well. So there are many many questions, and I and I will just. I will make a brief comment, and there is probably a question there for both of you. And I, I, I was struck, Miguel, when you said it's scary but realistic. And then I uh, and I get a sense from the the rationale that leads to this realistic scenario: the disinformation campaigns, right? The 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 hatred, uh, the values. And like the you know the the politicking, the gerrymandering, as as uh, Patricia was mentioning, I, I'm curious to hear a little bit more what you think about the voter, because we tend to say in Brazil that people vote with their pockets, so to speak, with like whatever however money they have. Um, but Patricia is suggesting and and making very clear that people vote with this information and values, people vote with resentment, you know, there's class warfare, there's, you know, there's, there is, um, there, there are so many things that people vote with. So this is a, this is a different election and it's, diff it's a different electorate somehow, you know, Brazilians have changed somehow and it, it, does, it doesn't seem to be towards a more egalitarian sense, you know, like, you know, similar to Hungary, you see where people are expecting uh, a larger rebuke of the, of the authoritarian leader and the country, 75% of people. And I, and I was just, I say this because I, I heard a, a, a talk, um, an interview the other day in the New Yorker by Stephen Kotkin, uh, the director of the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this event. And he's a, he's a Russian specialist, a specialist of Stalin. And he said somehow that Putin uh, succeeded in as much as he freed himself from the people. So the, the authoritarian works when he, in this, he used the, language, the word he, when he frees, when the oppressor frees himself from the oppressed, you know, and through various authoritarian means, he doesn't, even though he's not delivering economically and education and health, you know, so authoritarian leaders are able to free themselves and not rely anymore on the public opinion. You know, they can just go their way. So that's one of the readings that he said of how he could actually do this crazy violent crime against humanity, against Ukrainian uh, people and nation and state that he is, um, that he is uh, carrying out right now. So, so I just, I would like to hear a little bit more the anthropology Apology of this electorate somehow, you know, like who are the voters right now? Uh, Miguel mentioned 20, 25 percent of people who might, might turn violent, you know, contest the elections, you know. So, like, like, can you tell us a little bit more how how have Brazilian peoples in the plural changed in the past few years through this uh, through this authoritarian digital mass media? conservative turn, right? So. You want to start, Miguel, or should I start? Okay, I'll try. Not an anthropologist or... <laughs> Um, well, I, I, it's interesting. I think it, I have not read the interview in the New York, but it's interesting the freeing themselves from uh, the population, from the voters. 
which is basically, I mean, you got to a point of dismantling institutions that you no longer need popular support or, you know, that is frequently linked to economic uh, prosperity to remain in power. So that's, that's a scary outlook. Um, I think, well, polling, and we always need a grain of salt with polling, but polling shows that in 2018, uh, there was a very um, uh, open anti-incumbent uh, sentiment, basically against not incumbent Michelle Tabor, but incumbent Workers' Party, uh, because the party was, you know, uh, several years in power, there were corruption scandals. So there was this anti-PT uh, vote uh, that uh, people were very uh, focused on corruption issues. And then on the other hand, you had this part of the population that's been basically uh, patronized by the uh, center-left governments that have been governing Brazil for before Bolsonaro, all the center-left governments, who basically see in a very condescending way evangelicals, conservatives, values voters. So I think there was a core uh, electorate that voted for Bolsonaro because they finally felt represented. You know, finally we're not being ridiculed because we are against abortion, because we think religion is important, and so on and so on. So I guess com combining these things, and then you had uh, among these, uh, not the 20%, the, the core voters or the 20% uh, core uh, conservative Bolsonarista voters, you had the rational voters that Miguel mentioned that were basically people who also thought that economic policy under PT was bad, uh, which at some point was, and so they were trying to, uh, they were going to try something new. So now in 2022, uh, there was a sense among the opposition and among the Workers' Party. Uh, they were basically, we have this, this saying in Portuguese that you were wearing high heels, meaning they were super comfortable. We're going to win this because economic the economy sucks you know gdp is really uh, doing badly uh people are losing uh like income uh, level is going down and mainly inflation is really high you know over 11 percent in the last 12 months so i mean there's no doubt uh this is gonna be a positive election for us and that people would focus less on issues like corruption and more on uh, pocketbook issues. I think that's how you call it in English, right? So I do think that's still true. Uh, however, uh, I think what was underestimated was that the government would be willing to basically uh, destroy any kind of pretense of being economically or fiscally responsible just to start distributing money, which is what they're doing to specific constituencies like you know, truck drivers or policemen and to the population in general with this uh, attempt to expand uh, Bolsa Família now called Auxilio uh, Brasil. Um, there's a big question that what is going to be perceived as uh, the, the wealth effect, right? What is going to be more? The money, the, the direct cash transfers that are getting to people's hands and people are really impoverished. I mean, you look at the numbers, you look in the streets, you have like homeless people, you have people literally uh, eating bones or, or, you know, fighting for bones in trucks because they don't have anything to eat. So what's going to be uh, more uh, predominant? the sense of you know the wealth sentiment uh, because of the cash transfers or the way inflation is going to erode this wealth so this is one thing and the other thing is i think the other thing that was underestimated is the power of uh, the communication machine of the government and of bolsonaristas uh, to spread and to um, resuscitate the anti pt sentiment this is something that is ingrained in several people. So if you have a good communication machine, it's something that you can tap. I was reading uh, somewhere that some people might be, okay, so Bolsonaro did a really awful government, you know, economy is horrible, everything is horrible. So I'm going to vote for Lula, even though I don't like Lula. 
except when you start having a massive amount of pictures uh, going through social media of, you know, corruption scandals, you know, bringing all that back, that might change people's calculation, together with a slight uh, improval in economic conditions, which might happen this year. So uh, it's tough. It's a very tight uh, thing. A very fine line. Miguel, with the anthropologist hat now. Uh, you are the anthropologist. I want to hear you <laughs> answering your question as well. Uh, so yeah, I think um, I, I, I agree with Patricia because I think that um, uh, a lot of people uh, feel represented by Bolsonaro. And what I think it's extremely interesting is that it's in all social classes. Um, uh, and uh, and it's um, and I think that uh, I, I have a a very let's say um, I'm, I'm 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 very criticized for what, when I say this, but I think that Bolsonaro is not a political leader. I think he's a revolutionary leader. I think that uh, Bolsonaro is our far right Che Guevara or or something uh, 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 in this in this sense. Uh, he he behaves himself. As a revolutionary leader, uh, not as a political leader, and um, and he's constantly mobilizing people and everything that he's thinking. Uh, it's uh, uh, well, at least when I when I see his actions, I I only I only can uh, make sense to his actions uh, when I when I look through the lens of uh, uh, of mass mobilization. So he he's very efficient on engaging people constantly. So uh, con he's constantly, uh, um, uh, he, he's, he, he's talking to an audience and then he's engaging constantly his audience and, and, and all the time. So it's almost like politics were like a studio uh, to, to produce some content to put on social media and then get the engagement of the, uh, uh, the, the voters and his followers, et cetera. And um, what I think that uh, Bolsonaro uh, says that is so strong, because again, it's not for, for what he's doing in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, economic policies or, or social policies, uh, is that uh, what, what I think is that he's, um, he's saying to everyone that uh, even if you're extremely poor, even if you have a really hard life uh, with me, you can exert your power over someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically it's destroying all kinds of social or institutional structures uh, that society has built for centuries mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to prevent uh, 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 stronger people to harm uh, weaker people. And uh, so I think it's, um, and, and, and we can see this in many levels. Bolsonaro does not succeed doing uh, good economic policies, uh, but he succeeds on destroying the administrative apparatus that we have built. So when it comes to, to the Amazonian rainforest, um, he's not having like, a, he's, he's not like, I don't know, like a, a, a Don Corleone, big uh, mafia guy who like strategically looks at the Amazon and say, okay, so how can I make money out of this? No, he's only saying like, go, go and destroy the forest and I'll make sure that the Obama guys won't come and, uh, and pursue you. So uh, he's destroying constantly all the agents that could prevent um, uh, any kind of, of force being exerted uh, towards someone or something that is more fragile. Um, and I think that it's, um, that, that again, I, I when I when I was a student, I didn't like Thomas Hobbes. Uh, I thought he was very conservative. I didn't like it all, but I think that when it comes to Bolsonaro, it makes a lot of sense bringing back Thomas Hobbes because the idea of Hobbes is that in the state of nature, uh, uh, we are all free, and uh, because we are all free and we are in the state of nature, uh, a, a man uh, becomes the wolf uh, to another man, right? Uh, and um, um, basically the one who is powerful will uh, uh, certainly exert this power and his force against someone who's more fragile. That's why we need all of us to, uh, 
uh, to delegate part of our freedom uh, to a Leviathan, to a sovereign uh, who rule and, and to guarantee that uh, everyone can survive <laughs> or at, at least uh, not getting killed by the other ones. Um, so, and, and I think this is the, that what I, the impression that I have with Bolsonaro, of course, is anti-democratic and he's trying to destroy democratic institutions, but he's also against the administrative state. He's against public policy. He's against NGOs. He's against the press. He's against uh, uh, the political correctness, uh, which will be like a social construction or, or, or something that something that we have built in order to behave ourselves uh, and being respectful uh, with one another. Um, uh, uh, he's against Christian values, even though he says he's very religious. Um, uh, so again, I think that um, Bolsonaro, what's his trying to do, and I think this is very appealing uh, uh, in a very, uh, it will be like, a, 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 it's, it's bringing us back to this state of nature. Uh, I, I know it's it's uh, it's. I'll be very criticized by the, anth <laughs> the anthropologist, no, 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 but no, I think no, I think no, that's no, that's I, I think that's the you biggest get to force. That point of, like, of Bolsonaro. I think, I think our 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 public's also interested in that question: How has the authoritarianism seep into the social relational fabric of Brazilian society? And the way you phrased it is just um, it, it's very powerful, and it's important to think through that register. And we have a, a lively set of questions here. And um, uh, Lucas Prates here from Princeton asks, how do you see, and I will ask a series of questions now, okay? So how do you see the judiciary acting in these elections in terms of regulating them? We already saw the threat, right? Patricia already mentioned that. How do you see them preparing themselves uh, to act, you know, and if they are called upon to, uh, to and, and mobilized by people to to guarantee the the fair democratic election, you know, you know. So also from Mikaias, who is helping us here greatly. Um, Mikaias asked. Uh, he says, Miguel, you point out that this election is an opportunity to save democracy, um, uh, and for this reason, an exception, right? So can you tell us? Um, uh, we can see this, for example, by the Supreme Tribunal, uh, Supremo Tribunal Electoral, Supreme Electoral Tribunal, inviting European Union monitors to observe the electoral process. I was wondering if you both could share your thoughts on the potential role of international actors in the 2022 presidential actions of elections. So the judiciary, you know, international, um, supranational bodies, right? And then uh, a question from uh, Maria Luisa, who is also helping us here today with the event about fake news, Patricia. Do you see in the current scenario any interesting alternative to combat them managed or proposed through civil society? Where is there some, you know, we, you talked about the regulation, the self-regulation of the internet companies, the you know, the, the, the legal aspects that the judiciary is trying to, you know, uh, to, to prevent some of uh, misuse again, but you see which kind of mobilization do you see on the part of civil society? And then we have another uh, exciting round uh, after this um, interventions by Miguel and Patricia. Yes, Dr. Yes. Patricia. Okay. <laughs> um, how, well, first question, how the judiciary is going to act during the elections? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think we risk um, the judiciary overstepping its mandate, basically because we don't have, in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm talking about disinformation, and uh, basically because you have, on the one hand, the Procurador Geral da República, which I'm not sure how to translate this. It's like the, not sure what's the equivalent here in the US, but the general prosecutor, uh, I mean, he's totally um, dominated by Bolsonaro, right? So that's not gonna happen. We know the electoral, uh, Procurador Geral Eleitoral, it's also not gonna, you know, 
make waves in terms of pointing out irregularities or problems during the electoral process. So we end up having, uh, once again, the Supreme Court as the only uh, guarantor of last resort, so to say. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, this could be done in a very arbitrary manner. I mean, we've been seeing justices uh, exerting or, or you know, issuing rulings that are really uh, very, uh, how can I say that? I'm choosing my words here. Uh, rulings that are very um, uh, strict, right? Uh, and I mean, it, it's understandable because the rest is not working. So the, the Supreme Court has to work over time, sort of. But that's very risky when you leave it all to the judiciary, you know, to, to decide what's legal, what's not, what, what's dangerous, what's not in an electoral process. So uh, I think that's, that's complicated. Uh, we know that the electoral justice, it does not act uh, unless it's provoked. So you need to have... Uh, you no know, other parties or other candidates uh, reporting uh, uh, irregularities. So um, I, and, and they usually don't want to be very active in terms of not being uh, what I heard from the, some electoral, not the SCA, I'm talking about the uh, prosecutors, that they, want, they do not want to babysit the voters. So they don't want to be overly intrusive, but how can you maintain this, um, attitude when you have one side actively actively undermining the electoral process, right? So that's a, a good question. Uh, inviting European watchers, uh, I, I think that might be a horrible idea in, in the sense that we do have other observers, right, from the region, but everything, what, what's going to be, if you have European watchers saying, oh, everything was correct with the elections, that's everything that Bolsonaro wants, because it's the globalist mafia trying to interfere with the sovereignty. So, I mean, the Bolsonaro supporters, the one who are going to uh, doubt, have doubts about the results, are exactly the ones who are going to be, uh, you know, even more irritated if you have outside observers. And lastly, fake news, civil society mobilization. I think civil society mobilization is, is the one thing that works against fake news. Uh, on top, I mean, besides regulation, but we're all trying to get the right regulation at this point, right? But I mean, civil the only way uh, internet platforms respond, I mean, there's a way of changing the algorithm. You know, you just, you need to change the algorithm so that it's not going to give, uh, it's not going to amplify engagement or it's not going to amplify the extreme speech. But the only way internet platforms react is when you have public society, uh, civil society pressure, because that's going to damage their share prices, that's going to damage their brand. So that's the only way they react. So I think all the mobilizations, even though I'm really... Uh, uh, concern about this herd uh, behavior, you know, of, you know, pointing out or, or, but I think they're incredibly effective. We've, we've been seeing this with several uh, mobilizations and, and I think this is important. Thank you, Patricia. Miguel, back to you. Yes. Now, yeah, the Supreme Court, it's a, that's a gigantic debate and uh, I'm, I'm not a jurist, so, so, um, so for me, it's hard to comment, but I, what I, I feel from a political perspective is that um, the Supreme Court is perhaps the only institution in Brazil who has under, understood that we're living under a state of exception. And that in a state of exception, I know it's, um, in a state of exception, you need to, you need to act differently. Of course, I don't. I don't see um, this bringing any kind of of good jurisprudence in the future. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, but I don't think we're we're living in uh, uh, under democratic norm in this moment exactly. So so I think this is um, I think this is the way that the Supreme Court is managing to counter uh, anti democratic uh, initiatives, and and they are the only ones doing this. So um, so yeah. So in a state of exception, sometimes you need to um, 
to suspend uh, some of the norms. And, 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 and I think that this is, uh, it's extremely challenging for the future because this opens um, something that is, but again, uh, we're, we're living under the, the, the ideal thing, I think, will have uh, for the Supreme Court to have convicted Bolsonaro for racism, uh, for his declarations that were obviously racist, uh, Bolsonaro not running for president. This will be uh, the, the, the correct way of, uh, of acting, but they didn't do that in 2017. Uh, so now they're um, uh, they acting, uh, um, but at least they are acting. And I think it's perhaps the only institution among the big institutions that are really acting. Uh, again, uh, about, um, about the, the observers, I agree totally with Patricia. <laughs> Unless Marine Le Pen wins the election and Putin sends send some observers. And then I, think, <laughs> then I think with Putin and Marine Le Pen, perhaps, uh, this, but I agree. I agree. This is uh, this is probably this is everything that they want uh, in terms of narratives. So I agree that this 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 is not going to help us. And finally, um, uh, in terms of civil society and civil mobilization, I think that we had some great examples of uh, again when you don't, as Patricia said, when you don't have regulation, uh, you need to do regulation through the mobilization. So uh, the fact, for instance, defunding. Um, specific outlets, uh, I think it's extremely important. So I see an initiative like the Sleeping Giants uh, as something that is very interesting in terms of a, a regulation that is done by, by, by civil society in order to make sure that we can, uh, and to some extent, um, council, what we call council culture, um, uh, to some extent, uh, could also be used eventually as a way of uh, for civil society to regulate uh, um, or auto-regulate uh, some some of this this chaos and, and those fake news. So, so yeah, I think this is um, the the ideal world would have to have a regulation, but we know that it's this is not going to happen anytime soon. So, uh, so that's the way that civil society manages to organize itself in order to counter fake news. Okay, so I will. I have a. Um, there are many many questions, and I I will I will. I will uh, pass them on to you, all of them now. And then some will be for Patricia, some will be for, for Miguel. And then you just can give like a final, you know, round of, of comments, you know, please, you know, uh, as you wish, you know, we are, we are enthralled hearing you. We are learning tons from you. And um, so the first question from a journalist, Rodrigo Simon, our good friend to Patricia. Do you believe it's possible and even desirable that media and academia team up to fight fake news and how to do that. So media and academia teaming up to fight fake news. Uh, from our own Guilherme Fagundes to Miguel, do you agree that the Lula Alchemy Alliance can increase, let's call it the anti-institutional vote in this election? And then we have um, a series of, of comments, questions, you know, that get to the, to the pulse of the scary, realistic, but attempt to find uh, a way beyond the Bolsonaro alternative that, that came about in your, in your previous uh, comments and responses from our Bell Greener. Um, the question to Patricia and Miguel, do you see any space for hope? If yes, where could it come from? And a similar question from journalist Ricardo Kochku. In recent weeks, it seems that with Bolsonaro growing in the polls and public left concerns have also grown. What do you think is greater today, fear or hope? We want to start now, Miguel, and then we, we end with Patricia. Absolutely. So, uh, first of all, so the um, I, I totally agree that the Lula Alchemy, I think the Lula Alchemy Alliance, uh, it's uh, a step into the, dire the direction that was that was uh, I was talking about. So this is not a regular election. So you have two opponents who um, get together and um, and unite um, in a united front. Um, so I think this this means something for 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 the democratic field. And it, I think it's an important message. However, I agree 
uh, that um, Lula and Alckmin together means basically uh, uh, the two ruling parties for uh, the last 30 years together. Uh, and, and there's even um, an expression uh, uh, which, which is, uh, I don't know exactly why, but it's the scissors theater uh, from the far right uh, and our Brazilian alt-right um, media outlets. Um, basically, they, they, they said that they PTPSDB were not, a, 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 basically were always friends and they were basically dividing power uh, during the 30 years uh, and not doing opposition against each other, et cetera. Uh, and so, so the Lula Alckmin, it's basically the alliance, and and the and the, the and now they can prove that they were right about this chat the Shizora, as they they call. It. I don't know why they have this uh, this um, weird name. Uh, so, and and to answer um, the question about fear and hope, um, I, I'm I'm fearing more than I'm hoping, <laughs> uh, but I'm because I think it's. Um, uh, it's not only Brazil, it's an international scenario. Uh, uh, I, I think that Marine Le Pen in France, where you have uh, Macron is doing, I don't agree with uh, many of Macron's policies, but but he's doing a good government in comparison to his predecessors. And yet uh, it's quite possible that he loses this election. Um, uh, and what, what we're seeing in, in, in Russia, what we're seeing in the United States. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, and I, my, I'm, I'm fearing more than I'm hoping. But I, 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 I do hope that we still have six months for the elections to come and that I think that we have enough time uh, to constitute this united front against Bolsonaro. And, uh, and I don't think it's an united front in terms of electorate. I think it's great to have many candidates. I don't think we should have only one candidate against Bolsonaro. I think you, you should have plenty of candidates, but we should have plenty of candidates who are explicitly saying they are against Bolsonaro uh, and this is this should be the first message of all of them, uh, and 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 I think that we we should all of us should reflect how we are narrating uh, uh, the the um, this this election, uh, so that we can also um, I mean give, give give the seriousness that that it that it has. So that's that's my my message. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, Patricia. Well, so the question uh, by Rodrigo, right? Mm -hmm. the, about the media academia. Mm -hmm. Great question, uh, Rodrigo. I think um, we are already teaming up, media and academia, and we should do this more often. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of reporting about this information, I mean, I've been working together with uh, researchers and, and academics that are doing quantitative research uh, or qualitative research about this information, about the effect of this information. And, and so they are doing this incredible work. And then we in the media, we're trying to spread this work to get you know, more people to see what's happening and maybe to translate a bit uh, you know, to more uh, a, an easier language so that we all understand and to make it more, um, you know, even using social media to spread this quality information that comes from the academia. I think that's that's the way we should partner. I do not think that, and I think that's very important. Uh, this is a controversial opinion, but I think that media should not engage in activism. I think um, that's something very important. I think we can fight for the things we believe, be it, you know, anti-racism, be it democracy, by writing stories reporting, investigating. This is the way you do, right? So no activism, no proselytism, uh, I'm not sure how to say that in English, uh, proselytizing, no yes. proselytizing, you know, you can just do stories, you know, reporting. Uh, and then uh, a question by Ricardo Cocho, who's one of the greatest journalists in Brazil, I think it's Ricardo Cocho who, who yes. sent the question, mm -hmm. uh, who's a wonderful. Uh, fear or hope? Uh, see, I guess I'm, I agree with uh, Miguel in that, uh, in a sense, I think people are normalizing uh, Bolsonaro and people are viewing this election as a normal election. And we have been seeing 
very scary uh, results. I mean, seems like the pendulum is swinging back. We see, you know, Marine Le Pen doing well. We saw Orban. We're going to see uh, in the Philippines, uh, not Duterte, but, you know, Marcos' uh, son. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of populists that are going, going back to power. Uh, oh, and not to mention midterms in the U.S. That's probably going to be horrible for uh, the Democratic Party. And you're going to see several uh, Trump uh, supporters or enablers going back to power. Um, so in that sense, um, I, I would hope that this message, people would actually realize the importance of the election and unite behind, you know, democracy. Uh, that should be above any other concerns, you know, uh, not, you know, petty, you know, like the X, Y, Z policy. It's, it's just not the time. The time that there's a more pressing issue now, which is democracy. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia and Miguel, for your generosity of time and insight. You know, we learned so much from you and we certainly look forward to having you back here. It's very... Um, uh, it's a somber uh, scenario, but your sobriety and, um, and the fact that you push us to, to see the big picture and the large stakes and of what matters differently now is so timely, so important. And I think your thinking and your storytelling has a mobilizing force. And, and we hope, we leave it on that, right? On that hope, on that mobilizing force of this, of this kind of thinking of the stakes. Uh, of this of this, of this crucial uh, election in Brazilian history and you know for the possible future. So for our viewers, thank you so much for watching, for sending your questions. Unfortunately, we were able unable to pass them all on to on to our speakers, but really appreciate you and we hope you will be here with us for our upcoming Brazil Lab events. On May 5th, we will host a timely conference on Amazonian leapfrogging tackling the climate crisis and social inequality with nature-based solutions. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned to the updates of our beautiful and powerful Spali Lima Barreto platform. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Again, Patricia, Miguel, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, stay well and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Huge honor. Thank you, João. Thank you all. Thank you so much, João, Miquel, Patrícia. Thank you so Pessoal, much. Pessoal, obrigado, Patrícia.